Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about um, different flow regimes um, that are encountered when you have a body flowing in a gas. And at the top of the board uh, you can see the four different flow regimes I'll be talking about defined in terms of their Mach numbers. So before I can continue on, um, I want to define the Mach number which relies on the definition of the speed of sound. So first we'll look at the speed of sound, which you can see here. And the definition for all gases in general is this equation here, um, which I might derive in another video, um, but it essentially says that the square root of the uh, change of pressure with the change in density isentropically uh, is the speed of sound, and this is valid for all gases. Uh, if we make the assumption that it's a thermally or cal calorically perfect gas, we can bring it down to a more well-known definition for the uh, for the speed of sound, which you might have seen, which is the square root of the uh, ratio of specific heats and then the specific gas constant and the temperature. Uh, so the Mach number, as you can see over here, is defined by the uh, local velocity over the local speed of sound. And where it's a non-dimensional value because both of the uh, both the velocity and the speed of sound have the same units. Um, so you can imagine a flow field where uh, you have, even in this room, at every single point there are molecules and at every single point these molecules are traveling at different uh, velocities and it has a different temperature here than it has over here um, so you end up getting not just one Mach number for this entire room but there's it's different at every single point um, okay so I'm going to change my marker so it'll be easier for you to see which regime I'm in so I'm talking about subsonic now I'm going to use the blue marker so the subsonic regime is a flow field where the flow is everywhere less than one. Um, okay, so let me get rid of this. Okay, so when I'm talking about the subsonic um, and the transonic regime, I'm going to be using the, an airfoil to show you kind of what's happening. So we have an airfoil in a flow field, and we have the flow coming in at some velocity, free stream velocity, v, uh, v infinity. And so for subsonic, um, we have continuously varying properties in this entire field around the airfoil. And what it means is that the flow, the molecules are traveling towards this airfoil, and as they get towards the airfoil, they they sense its presence, and what happens is um, the flow field adjusts to, let's say, the pressure um, based on what it sees in the flow. So the molecule says, you know, it gets to the airfoil and says, oh, there's something here in my way. So what happens is it can propagate its knowledge of the body that's in the flow upstream. It actually propagates it at a speed uh, equal to the speed of sound. Um, so because it's allowed to do that, it propagates it upstream um, and you have this continuously varying flow around here um, with continuously varying properties. Uh, so everywhere around here in this entire flow field out to infinity, um, it's always going to be subsonic. So what happens with uh, supersonic, and I'm going to skip over transonic really quick to go to supersonic and then we'll skip back to transonic. So then with supersonic flow, um, I will use a, I'll use a wedge for this. So this is just some wedge that's in a flow. Again, you have this V infinity coming at it. Now, the particles are moving towards the body here. And since the properties are usually propagated upstream at the speed of sound, but sin then since this body is actually moving faster than the speed of sound, they're not actually able to propagate back upstream. So what happens is a shock wave forms. So you end up having a shock wave. So this is the wedge. And across this shock wave, you get, it's a discontinuity. So the temperature will increase, the pressure will increase, the density will increase, uh, based on some relations that I'll define or derive in a later video as well for shock waves. Um, so what you have is, I should have gone over the definition of a streamline before, but um, 
a streamline is a streamline is a quantity where at every single point um, a streamline is always tangent to the uh, to the velocity vector in the flow field. So if your velocity, so if your flow field has a velocity, if I define my flow field at these discrete points here, and each point has a velocity vector like this, and maybe these are kind of more horizontal like that. If I draw a streamline in here, the streamline would be tangent to this velocity vector, and once it got to a point that's maybe here where the velocity vector changes, it would have to be changing continuously to always be tangent to the velocity vectors in the field. Okay, so what happens in in the subsonic? Oh, should have changed my marker color. What happens in the subsonic regime is that um, is that the streamlines are continuously changing and they're continuously varying. But for the supersonic, you have streamlines when they pass through the shock wave here on the wedge. This is the streamline. When it passes through the shock wave, it immediately changes direction. So it's a discontinuous jump across the shock wave. Okay, now the. I'll remember to change the marker this time. So now we get into the interesting regime of the transonic. So when I was talking about supersonic, that means that it was supersonic um, everywhere in the flow. So across an oblique shock behind, once I go over these relations in another video, you'll see that the flow is usually, most of the time, going to still be supersonic once it passes through a shock wave like that. So for the transonic regime, I'm going to go to uh, the airfoil. So now I'm going to do a regime where the Mach number is it's going to be less than, it'll be greater than approximately 0.8 and less than 1. So in this regime, we're going to have an airfoil like this. So the flow coming in here this is my free stream Mach number. So the flow coming in here is going to be subsonic. So it will be less than 1. Now over an airfoil, the pressure changes, as you might know. And as the pressure decreases above an airfoil, the velocity will increase. So if you have an increasing velocity here, um, you w might develop a locally supersonic area kind of in this region. And then what happens is you, you'll have a shock wave a little bit farther down in the supersonic region that'll bring it back down to subsonic. So you'll end up having a subsonic area here. This will be locally supersonic. And the area in front of the airfoil before it gets to the point where it turns supersonic will be subsonic. So what you have in this regime, where the free stream Mach number is less than, is subsonic, is you'll have the, you'll have subsonic flow, supersonic flow, and then subsonic flow again. So it's this transonic regime where it's not subsonic because it's not locally subsonic everywhere. It's not supersonic because it's not supersonic everywhere. Um, so that's for when the free stream Mach number is less than one. And then if we go to the free stream Mach number is greater than one and less than approximately 1.2, I'm going to use the airfoil again. So what happens here is you'll have this, um, you'll have the free stream velocity and the Mach number is going to be greater than 1. So what happens on this is, since this is a blunt body, you end up forming something called a bow shock. And the bow shock is detached from the surface, so it's also called a detached shock wave. And what happens here is that you have this supersonic regime here. And then once it crosses this, it looks kind of like a normal shock wave. Um, and right at, and there's a point where it is a normal shock wave as opposed to an oblique shock that I showed before. And again, I'll go over some of these things in my later videos. Um, you end up getting subsonic flow here. So we'll have subsonic flow right here. Now we have subsonic flow, and now we're back into the regime where we were, that I was talking about just previously where you have sub subsonic flow going over the airfoil, and then at some point it becomes supersonic because it's speeding up because the pressure is decreasing. So again, you'll have this regime in here where you have, where you, it's an M, where you have supersonic flow, and then you might have a uh, shock wave um, back here where it decreases again to 
subsonic flow. So that's the transonic range, and that's because there are, there's both subsonic and supersonic flow uh, in the overall flow field. Okay, so the really interesting one is hypersonic. So I'm going to switch to the black marker now. Okay, so for hypersonic flows, I put down that it's greater than Mach 5, which is just a rule of thumb. It can be lower uh, when it changes to the hypersonic regime. It can be higher. Um, but it's the regime where certain physical phenomenon become more important as the Mach number increases. So, um, if I look at one of these wedges again, this is just a wedge. Uh, if you're in supersonic regime, you get this shock wave, like I said before. So you get a shock wave in the supersonic, and it's at some angle. Um, some angle off of the wedge. Um, as your Mach number becomes higher, your shock wave moves closer and closer to the surface. So you end up getting a shock wave that lies closer to the surface like that. And again, I can go over why this happens, the mathematical relations to why this happens. Um, so what you get are these certain physical phenomena that um, dominate when you get into this region that's higher than Mach approximately 5. So, one of these things is the thin shock layer. So, this layer between the shock and the body in here, this is the thin shock layer. Um, so, for a given flow deflection angle, like I was saying, the flow deflection angle is, is basically the angle off of the horizontal up to the, how, up to the angle of the wedge. So, I mean, this could be like 10 degrees or something like that. So, you end up getting, you end up getting, um, a shock wave that is close to the body for the same deflection angle. And what can happen is um, you can end up getting the, these terms might seem a little foreign right now, but I will go in more in depth in a hypersonic, just a hypersonic video because there's so much to talk about. But you'll end up getting um, the, the shock layer will merge with the viscous boundary layer that forms as you, uh, as you progress along the, the edge of this body. Um, Another thing that happens is you get an entropy layer. So I'm going to draw a, this is going to be a blunt body now. So you have some sort of blunt body here. And again, what you get with the blunt body is you get this detached shock wave, like this. And so what happens is for these, nor this, this resembles a normal shock here, normal shock being kind of a perpendicular to some body. Um, so you know, guys, that looks like a normal shock layer. So as you cross this, this portion right here, uh, the entropy increases dramatically, as opposed to if you're crossing this layer up here, which is more an angle to the flow, this jump here, the entropy increase will be less. So what you end up getting is, all along here, you get these uh, large entropy gradients. Um, and you develop this thing called an entropy layer, um, which interacts with the with the boundary layer as well. Um, okay, so then another big thing is viscous interaction. So because your flow is so high, or because the flow Mach number is so high, you have a large amount of kinetic energy uh, out here. And what happens when it crosses these shock waves here is it had the kinetic energy has to be um, converted into some kind of other energy. So the kinetic energy is actually slowed by viscous effects in here, uh, in the boundary layer, and it causes this thing called viscous dissipation, which can increase the temperatures uh, up to really high temperatures. Um, they can get upwards of 10,000 Kelvin, um, which is extremely high. Um, and another thing that happens is you get these large, uh, you get large boundary layers and the boundary layers grow faster in hypersonics than they do for lower Mach numbers. So if you get higher, or you get larger boundary layers, it can interact with the shock layer, and it'll feed into itself, and it'll, it's kind of like this loop um, where everything influences everything else, and it gets really complicated to, uh, to analyze, and you can't use all these simplifying assumptions that people have used uh, in the past. Um, and then another, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about just real quick is that it's, uh, you get these, like I was saying before, you have these high temperature, it's a high temperature flow now. 
um, because the temperatures increase across the shock wave, you get you can get dissociation and even ionization of the gases. So you'll have a chemically reacting flow behind your shock layer. Um, so you know for for air where you have you know you have nitrogen, you have oxygen out here. These can dissociate to become nitrogen atoms, oxygen atoms, and then what you can get is also there's these catalytic reactions at the surface that, um, depending on what happens to these nitrogen and oxygen atoms uh, within this layer, they can combine back into oxygen molecules, nitrogen molecules, they can combine back into nitric oxide, depending on what happens within this layer, um, greatly affects the heat transfer um, to the body, and that's one of the the that's one of the areas of uh, of research right now that's going on. Um, so those are just the four regimes, flow regimes that I wanted to talk about. I'd like to do a video where I go more in depth into the hypersonic one because um, I think it's the most interesting, and I think I'll also make some videos about um, shock waves and uh, and the like that I was talking about uh, earlier in the video. So. Um, I think that's it for this video, and thank you for watching.